then. Okay, so we have got some questions, and I'm going to put it to you. You can answer whichever ones you want. Some of them are going to be directed to some of you, but we do have an hour, and our lovely tech team is going to give me a countdown so that we make sure we can stick to it. These are the questions, and let's start off with this one. How do you overcome needing approval of those around? How do we not care of others' opinions about us? How do we feel content with ourselves? That's good. <laughs> you know, I actually think that's a lifelong struggle. Yes. Yeah. I think that um, there are periods where you just don't care because you can't be all things to all people. Yeah. And it goes back to what I said in the beginning, it's not a matter of who you are, it's whose you are. And we really live for the approval of one. You know, as we sing to an audience of one and we live for an audience of one, it's just that Jesus walked in favor with God and then he got favor with man. So if we look at the priority of always being where God wants us to be, because sometimes that will mean that no one else will like where you are. <laughs> Simply because of where God has called you to be, it will be in opposition to the flesh around you. So it's very important to be sure, am I in the place where God approves? When God approves, he will make the right people around us have favor towards us. We don't need everyone. We just need God and those that he selects to be in our lives. So I hope that helps because I think that what we try to do, there's this, especially with social media now, people are killing themselves when you get unliked. Come on now. Did that person pay your rent? Did they buy you lunch? They didn't do anything for you. You don't even know who they are. So it really kind of psychs you out. And you know, they did research and said that the people who made Facebook realized that there was a, a dopamine, uh, you know, there's a, a, a chemical that is released in your system every time someone likes you yeah. or smiles and, and literally it builds up um, you know an addiction to yeah. approval so an addiction to approval is an all-time high because we're now programmed to seek the approval of yeah. people around us and that is a distraction from God God says come unto me yeah. not unto the world okay yeah. so it's very very important to stop and say am I pleasing God Am I in the spot where he is pleased with me? I am not to fear anyone except that person that can kill the soul. Amen? So don't live for the approval of others. Live for the approval of God. Thank you. You're welcome. So good. So difficult. It is but difficult. But so good. Yes. <laughs> we have to keep reminding Life ourselves journey. of the priority. Yeah. Totally. I have a question, um, if you could start off Nande, and then I'm sure Michelle will probably want to add something. But uh, it's, it's two questions really. The, the one is, how do you trust again when the trust has been broken? How do you forget after you forgive? And then linked to that, somebody addressed a question specifically to you. How do, how do you forgive when you hurt so badly? Well, um, was the first one about trust. Yes. I think um, what's important to remember is that people are people. <laughs> so God is God. So people aren't God, and um, God is the only one we can trust completely, as the scripture says. So I, I think we need to be careful to put um, expectations on people to be God, because um, if I say people are people, it means people will hurt you. We already know this now. Mm -hmm. So a powerful thing that you can decide and maybe a resolve in your heart is to actually just, before anything happens to you, I, I already forgive you. Because that um, thing of forgiveness, is it's got to do with what's, what's happening in your life. It's releasing of you. And in terms of trust, so you don't trust them to, to save you or trust you to do the things that only God can do. You, you, you trust again knowing that they probably will fail. But then I think um, you need to talk to God about the nature of that relationship. I'm obviously answering this not having context of what kind of relationship you 
you're referring to. But if it's your, you know, if it's it's a colleague who keeps breaking a trust, then maybe you need to set some boundaries in what you're expecting of that relationship to happen. But if it's your spouse, someone you're married to, you know, and there's a covenant there, you better talk to God and say, look, help me in this area. But we all we go back to God because He is God. And then of people we really know that, you know, don't put expectations on people to be God because we will never be God. We will never be perfect. God is the only one who will never fail. He's the perfect one. Is that, is that okay? I just wanted to add about the forgetting piece because I think that when it comes to forgiveness, there are these assumptions of, uh, I should forget about it. Oh. <clears throat> God has the capability to throw our sins into the sea of forgetfulness and not bring them back up. We can ask God to heal our memories, but I'm not sure if he really wants you to forget because there's always a lesson to be learned in the midst of any offense or anything that happens. And that might not be uh, what that person did, but what you can do, yeah. um, how you can reposition yourself so that you're not in the same position again, yeah. especially when we get into cycles of things that seem to reoccur over and over in our lives. There's certain things we go, that person did it to me and that person and did it to me. And so then you, you're the common denominator. So there's a lesson for you to learn now so that that doesn't happen again. Okay. So, you know, and sometimes trust has to be earned, especially in the marital arena. If a trust has been broken, you've got to decide together what boundaries you're going to set to rebuild the trust covenant to rebuild it together. And that person should keep their part of it yeah. until they prove that they're not trustworthy. And then a different decision has to be made. Does that make sense? That makes sense? Yeah. Definitely. Michelle, specifically addressed to you, when, what do you do when your silent season seems endless? Sure. <laughs> you get in your swimming pool and have a pity party and then turn <laughs> grateful. <laughs> You know what? All I can say is it is best to rest in the silent season because the cycle of life is after the silent season, there will be a flurry of activity where you will miss one of those days in the silent season. And God has called you away in the silence because of what he wants to deposit in you, what he wants to show you. And usually when we enter the silent season, we don't even realize how burned out we were. And so God has says, come away a while and rest in me. But we are such doers, especially as women. We all, I feel guilty if I'm not doing something. I wake up in the middle of the night thinking I should be doing something. I mean, it's like, when does it stop? Can I find the off button? You know, so it's very important to, to go to God in the silent season and say, what do you want to pour into me? How do you want to refresh and renew me? What do you want me to hear in this season? Help me to embrace the season and enjoy it. Be grateful for it because the season will change. Did you want to add something to that, Nande? Yeah, amen. amen. <laughs> okay, somebody says, I agree that all things, even pain, work together for good. Mm -hmm. Romans 8.28. But did I understand you correctly that God is causing our pain so he can use it? Um, is pain not a consequence of sin? Is it caused by God? No, but he allows it. Um, he doesn't have to cause it. We cause ourselves enough pain. Um, you know, because we live in a world of sin, others cause us pain. Um, because we're free agents, you know, but God has already anticipated every pain and based on how we respond to the pain, he can actually use it to make something great happen. And that's why he says all things work to the good for those who love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. His purpose is always in the front of his mind. So he always has a solution for our pain. He doesn't cause it, but he will allow it to use it for his purpose. Thank you. Nande. Yes. We're going to kick off the... Every time she looks at me, my heart beats fast. Why? <laughs> I didn't know you felt that way, Nande. <laughs> We're going to get to that later on. There is a question about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're going to kick off our marriage and sex um, oh, slot. Are you ready? 
if I was blessed, married in the house of age, and through hardship I found myself in a position where leaving my husband, walking away from my marriage was my only option. I'm now a single mom. Did I go against God's plan? We've been separated for 18 months, not yet divorced. Do I pray for restoration or peace and, or go through with the divorce? Okay, great. Um, do you know, sharing from my story, obviously, um, I, okay, let me start here. God is for marriage. Marriage was God's idea. God hates divorce. I like to just put it out there so people, that's, that, that's what you know, because he, he hates it because he understands the tearing um, and the pain of it. It's not easy to be separated once you, you, you've been in covenant. So in my situation, I'm going to share my situation and then I'll answer the question. In my situation, obviously this came as a shock to me. I didn't know what to do. So what I um, have learned to do is to just stay in the word of God. This is my Bible. I stay in the word. And I said to God, well, this, this has come up, you know, what do I do? There's a scripture that I, I read that I, I'd actually never read before. And I read in this situation, asking God, and, and found in Job 22, there's a, there's a verse in, in verse 21, it says, yield and submit to God and be at peace. Obviously, in this time, I wasn't at peace. And he said, the first thing he said to me, submit to me. Take time, more than the normal time that you have to stay with me, to just learn from me and there will be your peace. There was a verse in 25 that says, you will then decide and decree a thing. I said, what did you mean? What do you mean? God said to me, because of what your ex has done, I could actually restore you. God actually told me, he said, I could restore the marriage but I can also release you because of what he did. There are verses in the Bible that, that explain, you know, when someone's unfaithful and all of that, how to exit. But God said, Nande, it is up to you. This is my situation. He said, you will decide, and whatever you decide and decree, I will establish for you. That's what verse 25 says. So mostly people want to come and decree things. That's how I could discern people were really praying for me or not praying for me. If they came with me with already, Nance, you better pray that man back. I was like, I haven't even decided you're decreeing that he'll be back. That's why it's important to submit to God and be at peace. It says you will decide, decree, and it will be established. What you confess as a daughter of the Most High God will be done. If you want your marriage to be, marriage to be restored, it will be restored because God is faithful. What is impossible with man is possible with God. The last verse in that, um, in that chapter, verse 30, it says, God will even rest you the one whom you intercede for who is not innocent. This is in the Bible. God said, the one who is not innocent you pray for, I will rescue you, him, through the cleanness of your hands. For me, that meant how I transition into this matters in God rescuing and restoring this man. He's a broken man, walked out of us, but how I speak of him in public, how I explain my story, that's directly linked. How I respond. I'm like, God, you heard me. I should be, you know. God said, no. How we, the cleanness of your hands. So this is my story. The mistake that we do, we want a checklist. Some pastor must say, don't do this when this. And it's not as clinical. Yes. We, because we don't know. You see, we don't know the future. We are not God. It's important to go to God and ask. So in your situation, I don't know how it started. I don't know the pain that you've been through. I don't know what's happening even in this separation time. But I want to say, my sister, you better talk to God more than you've ever spoken to him before. Ask him for direction. And that's where you'll get your peace. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be in people's opinion because today I might think this and tomorrow I might. And now if you're going to be, it's going to be inconsistent if you're going to try to please everybody. Submit to God and be at peace. He'll give you instruction and then once you've decided and you decree that with your mouth, it's going to be established. And then the future, it's on. <laughs> it's on. I hope that liberates and sets you free. And I'll add this. She said something very critical to go to God. Because God might tell you to walk away. Um, he hates divorce, but 
It is not an unpardonable thing. And based on the circumstance, he doesn't want you to be abused. Yeah. Okay? God always chooses the greater good. And he even, he loves his women so much that he says, if a man doesn't treat you properly, he will not answer his prayers. So it is very, it is such an individual thing. There's a story of the Levite concubine. From the, from the look at the tale, it looks as if she ran away from an abusive situation. Her father was reluctant to let her go back, but he released her to go back because he was under the law. You see how the law can kill? And on the way home, that same man submitted his wife to tremendous abuse that caused her death. So sometimes we go back to a situation that could kill us. And God wants to save you from that. And I always tell people, you know, don't beat yourself up over a divorce. God got a divorce. He wrote a writ of divorce against the, the children of Israel, and he remarried the Gentiles. So God has a second wife. So we cannot hold each other above a higher order than God himself. When, that, when, when his first wife broke covenant, he remarried. He wrote a, a divorce right against them. It's in scripture, okay? Through the prophet Jeremiah, I believe it was. He says, you know, I'm divorcing you, okay? So divorce is not the first option. It says, after having done all, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. So try to work through it. It shouldn't be an excuse for he irritates me because he won't pick his socks up. No, that's not a good reason. <laughs> But abandonment, abuse, and adultery are the three A's, okay, that are foundational because they break the very fabric of covenant. So God hates it when we break covenant because it is our reflection of our covenant with him in heaven. But he's very protective of you. So if you're in an abusive situation, you need to pray about that because if you've got children watching, they're going to then be attracted to an abuser or become an abuser. So the ramifications roll out beyond your personal situation. So you have to be very sensitive to the leading of God and then stand firm in that and he will recover all because that's what he's promised. Offenses will come in life. That is guaranteed. But he says he will repay. He will replace everything that was taken from you. That's very good. And then last thing I want to say is the way that God restores, he doesn't restore like man. You know, mm -hmm. if you read even the book, I love the book of Job now, it's just become a personal favorite. Yeah. Like you can count all of that, that Job had at the beginning. And in the last chapter in 42 verse 10, he, he got double. So how God restores, never underestimate the restoration yes. of God. And so Amen. if you're praying for restoration, maybe you have an idea in mind, but it's going to be triple fold. It's mm -hmm. going to be double. It's going to be more than than you ever had before. Remember, his names, it's, you know, his, his name's on the line. Yeah. Amen. People know that wherever I go, I say I'm a child of God. And so what happens in my life, people are watching. And so God gets the glory. And I believe Amen. that he can do anything. Nothing is impossible for God. Amen. 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 Well, and I think both of you, I'm sure you have regular flirtations from the opposite gender, and this one is about that. And so I don't know who to put this to. <laughs> Michelle, you were telling Barbie and I a few stories, so maybe I'll put this one to you. <laughs> they were a long time ago. <laughs> this person saying, as a happily married woman, how do I resist the excitement of flirtation and temptation from male colleagues? who flatter my ego and pay me attention. I always seem to be looking to others for approval to build my self-worth. Mm. Okay, girl. You as a married woman, I'll let you do your thing first. <laughs> you know, I had already exited this WhatsApp group. Nanda left the group when she said, I was like, Michelle can take this one. <laughs> I'm not even sure I heard all of the question, really. So this person is happily married. That confuses me as well. So you're happily married. Okay, great. You love your marriage. It's not that you want to end your marriage. You love your marriage. But you also... What? Who's flirting with who now? Well, so the men in the, in the office are flirting with, with her, and she's 
wondering how to resist the temptation because she's finding just some self-worth in that, in the approval from these other men. Oh, wow. You need to, girl, you need to get, you need to get more God and you time. Do you know once God affirms you, everything else seems like whatever. <laughs> Do you know when God, when, when, I've, when I've endured a season and God thanks me, no matter how much Pastor Bobby may write me a beautiful card and people, will, for me that's like when God rewards you. When God says thank you, when God says my girl you're beautiful, it is more powerful and meaningful to me than any other girl you had. You wanna, like it's, it's like once you've tasted good that is just like I mean your, your husband or your man, because I've been married, I was married for three years, like he can't even give you what God gives That's you. Right. There's, you develop an appetite. I love that you, you, you said something towards those lines yesterday that you, you just develop an appetite for that awesomeness. I would say if, you, if you're finding this to be a struggle, and it sounds like it is, if you, it's, you're enjoying it a little, spend more time with the Lord. Because those things are just, you know, this, it leads up to destruction and then all of a sudden you your husband's not enough and, and he was actually a great man and it's all confusing um, I'd say spend time with the Lord spend time with the Lord and just l learn how he he pursues you he loves on you he rewards you and and then you want to know what all of the what your man gives you your husband gives you his addition and then what your colleagues that's 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 a devil yeah. Let's just call it what it is. That's the devil trying to distract you. And like, so I've obviously been married. Like, I know what it means to be touched and loved and all of these things by man. And right now I'm, you know, transitioning well and God has something for me. But in this season, look, I'm not going to settle for, you know, what's not God's best for me. Because, you know, you, 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 no sex before marriage, now you're married, and now you're not married again. So, still applies. I, like, I can know God has the best for me. So, I think the, to answer the question, spend time with the Lord and just great, great affirmation from Him. And then you'll realize that you don't really want your colleagues flirting with you, and you rebuke it. It's like, hey, mm -hmm. I'm not that kind of girl. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Because it is actually an act of disrespect. Yeah. They know you're married. Yeah. And if you were really happy, or they got the opinion that you were really happy, they wouldn't cross that line. So um, examine your heart oh, wow. and ask God, what is the need that is really there? Yeah. And that's something you take to your husband and give him the opportunity to fill it as best he can. And then you rely on God to do the rest because God has created us all to fail one another just slightly. Because if anybody could be our all in all, we wouldn't need God and he won't allow that. He won't share his glory with another. So he will leave that little space of disappointment even with your mate because that's the part of you he wants to fill. There's a God-sized hole in your heart that only God can fill. And so your expectations have to shift. And your identity and your affirmation has to be in God. And then you are the glory of your husband. So how you present yourself to the world lets others know how he's making you feel and how he's taking care of you. And so if there's any deficit there, that's what the enemy uses as a foothold to try to tempt you and make you feel like you're not getting enough. So it's very, very important to do the hard work there and see their approach to you as disrespect and nothing that is pleasant. Just leading on from something that both of you um, just tapped into a little bit, and that is also 
our response to that kind of yes. behavior yeah. is so important because we can encourage that yes. or, or we can actually down. shut it down. Mm -hmm. um, and so if, if it's going to be giggling and like Ooh. playing back and it's, it's dangerous territory. Yeah. I'm very good with the shutting down here. I'm known as a blocker. So, so <laughs> are you willing to give personal lessons afterwards? Do not for those who need begin. to block. <laughs> You don't even it's look really like how you present you could yourself. Be it's true. Mm. Yeah. No, no, I'm known. Do not pass begin. They're just things where I'm like, you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm whole. I'm complete. What you adding to my life? Just, you know. <laughs> I was sharing with Barbie just yesterday about, you know, very high level pastor that was saying to me, he's single, of course, but thank God. Sure. Hey, disclaimer. But, because I know the story, so I'm like, oh. <laughs> But you know, he was, you know, doing his whole flirt thing with me, and he says, but I know you wouldn't go for any of that. I mean, he already knew. And he said, you know, I really respect you for that. You represent God well. And I thought, oh, God, thank you. You know, and so there's a way that we carry ourselves that can really signal if you're open or closed. You know, um, the, in Song of Songs, the brothers said to the Shulamite woman, are you a wall? If you're a wall, we will honor you with silver. But if you are a door, we will enclose you in wood. And what they were saying is, are you loose? Or are you closed and pure? If you're pure, we will honor you. But if you're loose and open, we will go ahead and just kill you and put you away. So, you know, it kills us when we don't honor ourselves enough to make others honor us. Wow. Okay. So, ladies, let's talk about sex. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's, let's talk, talk about, about you. Hey. <laughs> I'm not supposed to know that song. Don't anybody in this room tell anybody I know that song. <laughs> So I thought it would be wonderful if the three single ladies up here could take some time to talk about sex. <laughs> Nande, Nande has, has been exited married. the group. <laughs> <laughs> I have a very vague memory. <laughs> Mine's a non-existent one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so speaking from, <laughs> this person says, I've been married for more than 10 years, and I don't particularly enjoy sex. Mm. Don't respond, because I thought, how many married women are going to say, amen, I, I, I wrote that one. <laughs> don't say anything. I know it is very important to a man, so I'm worried that it might affect my marriage. Men need it. I can live without it. <laughs> Any Not tips on what to do? I'm also a mom, I work, and I'm exhausted all the time. Mm, that, that could be a big factor. You know, sex is less physical and more mental and emotional. So those are the two things you have to work on. And talk to your husband. You know, I mean, this is the thing. I don't know why we don't have conversations about sex with the person that's able to make or break the experience. Now, there are different reasons why it could be unpleasant. It could be psychological. It could be a bad experience you had if you were violated or abused. It could even be physical and you need to see a doctor to get that worked out. So there are lots of reasons for it not being a pleasant experience. God created it to be a pleasant experience. Yeah. Sex is actually worship. Yeah. So a lot of times if a woman is offended by her husband, she will not be turned on. So you need to settle that offense so you can get back to the place of love and respect, okay? Um, maybe you think he's not living up to the fullness of what he should be as a man. Whatever it is, you need to work that out psychologically, okay? Because God created sex to be the glue, in your marriage. You and also for it to be a foretaste of the glory we will experience when we become one with him. Okay? <laughs> That's why we'll need a glorified body because we won't be able to sustain that amount of pleasure throughout eternity in this <laughs> earthly body. <laughs> I hope that puts it in a different light for you. So you're supposed to be experiencing glory. That's why people say glory. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Let's keep
keep it real here. So that- <laughs> Nanda is literally running out the door. Uh, uh, <laughs> so these are conversations you have. You've got to know your body. You've got to know what pleases you and, and make it a game. Make it the hot, cold game. Oh, yes, that's hot. Oh, no, that's cold. That's not working for me. You know. Make it fun. Have a sense of humor in the bedroom. But remember, above all things, that it's worship. So you need to go home and tell your husband, baby, let's have church. Okay? Your body is the holy of holies. And he is the high priest. And he needs to come in and minister. But there are rules for pleasure, okay? So talk it over and just lighten up. I think we take it too seriously and that kills the fun aspect. This is supposed to be the place where you're supposed to enjoy and rejoice in in the lover of your home, okay? Read Song of Songs, get in the mood, set the atmosphere, light the candles, make the room smell good. You know, set the atmosphere, make a date night. Get back to what caused you to get married in the first place. Restore that passion. I must say I'm really glad that the Ghana sound discs right now is black. (laughs) Because I can't see the blushing. (laughs) But I'm sure he's dying inside. (laughs) He's gonna like leopard crawl out of this auditorium any moment. Uh, Yeah, because a man's identity is all wrapped up in that. So we got to work that out. You know, they feel so rejected when we don't want them that way. And, you know, they don't understand. So, you know, get counseling, see a doctor if you must, but set the atmosphere, make it fun again. Well, Michelle, you know, when that man comes, we coming for a few weeks. We coming to Ghana to just... To set ourselves up for a win. Sure. I'm telling you. Glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> so, um, Michelle, any books on marriage um, that you've written that, oh, yeah. that you would recommend to our ladies over here? Yeah, The Power of Being a Woman, Secrets from a Man's Heart, wow. um, How to Get the Best Out of Your Man. That sounds like one you definitely need. There are a few books out there, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. <clears throat> Another question I'll put to you, Michelle, first. I'm in a relationship with a woman, and we love each other. God doesn't make mistakes. Does God still love me for who I am? I asked the same question last year, they said, so they're hoping to get an answer this year. Okay. Well, you know, uh, let me start by saying this. I have a lot of friends in that situation, and I love them very much. She said something very key. God doesn't make mistakes, and that's true, but we do. We make mistakes. Um... I always tell my friends, I think part of the problem is the church has made this a special sin. It is not a special sin. It's just sin, like all the rest of the sins. And I don't like the fact that a group of people gets picked on because they're misunderstood. God understands all things about our makeup. He knows the scarring, the wounding, the experiences that lead us to a place that might be outside or is outside of his will. And it is not his perfect will for our lives. Um, It's interesting that scripture says all things are lawful, but all things are not beneficial. And there are consequences to any relationship that is unfruitful. Um, Two people of the same sex cannot bear fruit together. And when God created the earth, he created everything to bear fruit. So that is the first hint that we're out of alignment. Um, But God has a way of working on our hearts if we really want him to. Because ultimately, it's not even about pleasing ourselves or making ourselves comfortable on this earth. We all struggle with something. The married person struggles with temptation, like we just heard. The single person struggles 
with wanting to have sex and she shouldn't or he shouldn't. Uh, the gay person or the lesbian struggles with having a same sex attraction when they shouldn't. So we all have a struggle. And isn't it interesting that we all have a sex struggle? <laughs> so then why does the church make your struggle special? It's not special. We all have a struggle, and yet we're all called to submit ourselves to God and walk in alignment with his perfect will. And grace is bigger than just salvation. Grace enables us to walk and do what God asked us to do. So it comes down to how much do I really want to please God? Am I willing to embrace the grace that he gives me to resist the temptations that pull at my flesh, that distort my desires away from what God wants them to be? And will I embrace the grace that he will bring healing to me, transform me, and pull me into complete alignment with his will and his word so that I walk with no fear? Because see, it, but it does work against your confidence because there's always that thing at the back of your mind. Am I right or am I wrong? And God doesn't want that there. When he, when you are in a perfect alignment with him, you have perfect peace. And the issue that I have is when we're forced to celebrate, not tolerate, because celebration then affirms that you're doing the right thing. You see what I'm saying? Um, if I'm sure that I'm right, I don't need anybody else's approval. I don't need anybody else's permission. But if I'm constantly in question of that, then I've got to go back to the Holy Spirit inside of me because that's the person inside of me that keeps calling me back to the center of God's will. And that's the voice that I really can't escape. It's not a condemnation. You see, the Holy Spirit doesn't condemn. The Holy Spirit convicts, and what that means is he just reminds you of who you are and what is beneath you. So what he says is, you're a daughter of the king. That's not for you. Remember who you are. That's not for you. And that's the thing that we try to shake off and explain and get other people to agree with us so that we feel better about it. But in the end, we cannot ignore the voice of the Holy Spirit. And if that be the case, his grace is there. And God says, Paul said, three times I asked God to take this thorn in my flesh away from me. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you. And so I would ask that you would go to God and say, God, this is how I feel. These are my feelings. These are my desires. What can I do about it? I can't do anything about it, but you can. You can change my heart. You can realign my desires so that I'm in perfect alignment with your will and your word so that I can walk in peace. And that's my prayer for you, that you would have peace and not be under condemnation. Thank you. Another one more relationship question. How do I open the lines of communication in an eight-year relationship, especially when I know the outcome might not be what I want or expect it to be? And they have a four-year-old daughter together. How do I open the lines of communication in an eight-year relationship, especially when, I guess, she fears what the outcome of that is? So she already knows. <laughs> I guess maybe um, she's speaking because she's tried to talk and it's, it's not worked before. I think I'd be going against my own word if I don't say again, <laughs> to try again. But this time, maybe try with God. Like before you go to um, your spouse to talk and say, please, can we talk this out? Go to God. Like, <laughs> I feel like that's my standard answer because I know that to be something that works. I think we limit God and we expect him to work in a certain space or scenario or situation and then other places we block him out. But he's actually all powerful. Yeah. He's the only one that can change man's heart no matter how many times. And so I, 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 would, I would say to you, go again and try again, please. Then you know that you've tried. But this time, try with God. Ask God to help you how to speak. Maybe after eight years you forgot or you didn't really learn how to speak to this person, this relationship. Or maybe you, you don't, because remember communication is not about talking. It's also about listening. Maybe you haven't been hearing them. Maybe it's not even them. Maybe it is them. 
and maybe they haven't been hearing you in what you want to say. So I'd say spend more time preparing for that communication, more time in prayer, more time seeking God. And then once you'd be so surprised how when you go to that, God actually works in your favor and diffuses the situation. Where there was anger, there will be no anger. When there was God, we, we underestimate the power of God. God is able to intervene in things like that. I am not in a relationship setting, but I had a situation with an employer where I just felt there is not going to be any breakthrough here. I felt, well, this is, it's unfortunately how it's going to end. And in the future, we won't be able to, you know, connect. But God helped me then, was able to have a decent conversation. I was, I had to even write down my thoughts because I didn't want to forget what I'm going to say. But it took a lot of preparing. It took a lot of just dying to self and spending time with God to confront it. Because that's another thing is, well, we can't leave things to be and just like, let's see how it works out. And especially in a marriage and where they have a child, I'd say go for it again. Try again. Try to talk to them. But this time, go with the power of God and all of heaven's backing on you. And just like, I'm praying over that and speaking life into that situation that your spouse will hear you and um, God would have his will in that. Go again. Go with God. Can, can I Could I throw a spanner in just before you answer? Mm -hmm. This person wrote a relationship, eight-year relationship, not a marriage, mm -hmm. oh. and they have a four-year-old daughter. So I'm just wondering, what if marriage. this situation uh. is, what if this conversation is somebody saying, I want to get married, and I know if I ask sure. if it's ever going to end there, yeah. it might say, no, what do I do? Exactly. So if that's the situation, I'm not, I don't know. Oh. I'm just yeah. throwing it's another like, you know, curve. You dating if that, for what eight would years. You do? Guys, do you guys date for eight years? Uh, I would because say that. Remember, no, wait, wait, wait. Well. I'm not judging, but I'm just saying that I, I thought, I thought this, because I might be wrong, I'm 29, turning 30, end of the month. But I, I thought the purpose of dating is to discern character. Like, I know you can't discern character over a phone, or, so people go into this time where they get to know each other. Is that brother taking eight years to discern? <laughs> <laughs> You know what, though? <clears throat> Sometimes, because I believe, based on scripture and folks that I knew, that a man knows from the very beginning what his intention towards you is. But our actions bring that to pass or not. Uh, my, my mentor, Bunny Wilson, used to say that, you know, testosterone is released in a man every 72 hours. And it is actually God's way of waking him up and saying, fool, go find your wife. <laughs> And well, yeah. I don't know what's happened to my husband, so, Michelle. You must be a real fool. Your wife. <laughs> so what happens is, if we indulge in intimacy with them, we put them back to sleep. And we're like, when will they wake up and name us? But you keep putting them back to sleep. And he can sleep for eight years. He can sleep for 10 years. He can sleep for 20 years. And then wake up one day and marry someone else he only knows for three months. <laughs> Because that's what happens. You know, it happens time and time again. So you have to, it's like a business deal. You got to be willing to lay down your terms and walk. Yeah. You got to be willing to walk. My mother had dated my dad for a year. And after the end of the year, she said, it's been nice knowing you. And he said, what? And she said, oh, I never give more than a year of my life to any man because I think a man should know what he wants to do by then. So I'm, it's been nice knowing you. He said, oh, we're getting married. They were married. Like, you know. So, you know, you got to throw down the gauntlet. You've got to see, this goes back to your identity again, women. How much is your love worth? It's not for free, like Jennifer Lopez saying. No, no, no. <laughs> your body is not for free. Your time is not for free. Because yeah. we don't have time to waste as women. Because, see, they get handsome as they get older. We get tired as we get older. <laughs> So you can't do that. You cannot do that. So you've got to come into it knowing, yes, I, you know, it says that the woman was created for the man. That means we were a gift to man. God's gift to man. And you need to see yourself that way and know your worth and lay down your terms. And the minute he tries to put his hands on you, you say, where is this relationship going? What are your intentions? then you need to follow through on your intention and then you can touch the cookies, okay? So now, 
Well, because kisses are not promises and sex isn't either. Gee. And a man is built in such a way that he can't, because see, the way he's made physically, he gets to drop it off and leave. We still have it inside of us. And that's why. You know, Bobby can hardly even breathe. She's laughing so much. And that is why it's hard for us <laughs> to extricate from the relationship. You know this. You know that it's easier to break up with someone that you never slept with versus someone you had. So, um, you know, have the talk. God might work it in your favor, but otherwise tell him to get out of the way because he's blocking Boaz. Maybe he's holding up your love connection. He's in the way. Preach it, sister. Okay. So, you know, you, you've got to, you got to change your view. You know, this is not about being desperate and thinking he's the last option. He's not. He's not. There are many options. Yeah, yeah. And God might be waiting for you to make the break oh, wow. so that he can bring that person into your life that he has for you who recognizes your worth and is ready to seal the deal. Yeah. Now, if this is a marriage, just a few tips of communication. Like she said, first thing you do is pray. I love the book of Esther for that. There's a book on the table, How to Get the Best Out of Your Man, where I talk about this. But she fasted and she prayed before yeah. she took a very critical need to the king. And she didn't reveal it right away. She checked to make sure that all of his needs were met so he wouldn't be distracted yeah. by anything she wasn't doing for him when she applied her situation and then he jumped up and he was ready to kill for her you understand so there is there are some keys to communicating and it starts from a heart of being a servant to that person yeah. making sure that their needs have been met so that the enemy doesn't use that as a distraction and then submitting Beautiful. your need versus demanding your wants okay. does that make a difference yeah. honey I feel this way when you do that, is that what you mean? Because a lot of times, offense has nothing to do with you. It's the 10 things that happened before you showed up, and oh. now you've taken it personally. And you might find out, have you ever like been so upset with somebody, and you went to them, and they said, oh, I didn't mean that. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I just think you were, you were upset, told 20 other people, and now those 20 <laughs> people are mad at that person, and it was over nothing. <laughs> okay? So it's very, very important. The rules of protocol is you go straight to that person and say this happened and this is how I felt as opposed to you did this and you did that because you don't want them to defend themselves you want yeah. them to really hear what you said so that they're able to take it in and fix it for you empower the other person to fix it for you so those are just a few terms. I mean, we can get into it all day, but we got a well, couple more questions. Wow, so much deep stuff there. But you know the one thing that just I can't get out of my head? What? Uh -oh. I'm so disappointed that my husband's such a fool. <laughs> Every 72 hours, and he still hasn't shown his head. <laughs> I know. I mean, do you feel this? But how old are you? I mean, I'm 61. Wherever this guy is 41. sleeping, he's probably <laughs> dead by now. <laughs> Okay. Track hit him or something. Thank you. Something went wrong. <laughs> Moving on. <Wow>. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> on another note, <laughs> somebody says, How do I find my passion, my spark? None they still like hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to live my life to the fullest and I don't want to be just a tired woman. <laughs> So how do I find my passion and my spark okay. in life? I'm, this not, is this not a lie. This is the verse that I read this morning before I came here. It's in Romans 12, 11 in the trending um, translation. <laughs> the passion says, it says, be enthusiastic to serve the Lord, keeping your passion toward him boiling hot. Radiate with the glow of the Holy Spirit and let him fill you with the excitement as you serve him. Mm -hmm. I think that one, if you so when, and when you serve the Lord and you are in his presence in and about doing the Lord's work he infuses you with excitement with enthusiasm you, you don't need to look at like things or a holiday or a person or just serving the Lord gives you that excitement it says 
Be enthusiastic in so then look, keep your passion towards him boiling hot. If you would focus on your relationship with the Lord and keep that hot, you'll be surprised how that pours out, out into your life and you're suddenly not as tired. You can face up to the job that you need to do in the week. You can face up to the people you have a new perspective on just by keeping your relationship with the Lord hot. So maybe my question is on the bring back the spark in you and someone said to me the other day I don't know how you do it you've gone through this tough, tough time you have this um, you have a toddler she's not been well but you look amazing how do you find time to do your makeup and you've just got this glow about you and it's honestly God God is the only one that can give you that zest for life, that zeal, that oomph, that extra step in your beach, you know. He's the only one. And that nobody can take away. They might reduce my pay on Monday and I'm still going to be like this because I know this is hot. Yeah. And you know what too, I'm just going to add to that. I feel like I'm always adding, but it's okay. <laughs> Because I'm old, I get to say stuff. <laughs> you know what, too? The other part of that, what you said, is there's a natural outpouring of service that comes from that communion with God, where you start to see things in the, in the lives of others that it might take nothing more than a conversation. But what feeds you? I mean, have you ever spoken to someone and perked them up? They were depressed or whatever. And when you were done, they said, thank you. I feel so much better now. And you just felt full. Yeah, like you had just yeah. eaten a whole meal, you know? I mean, kind of like that Jesus at the well up, you know, thing. I mean, he didn't even, he wasn't even hungry by the time the disciples showed up with the food because he had totally re arrange this woman's life. And so just do you, but do it from a place of being full of God. And then what that does is there's a natural outpouring to yeah. others that will feed you and stir up passion and fire yeah. in your heart and excitement for life because you know that God is using you on a daily basis to touch and minister to somebody. somebody. Yeah. Wow, okay, if God has planned our life to the end, why must we pray if he's already determined the path of our lives? Do we just accept it? She's ready. I I'm gonna like let you have question. it and I'll add. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Prayer is not about us manipulating God to do things. See, we've been taught a lot of wrong stuff about prayer. Prayer is your intimate time, your intimate space with God. It is your time of communion. It is your time for him to give you instruction. Because you're right, he does know the end from the beginning. And nothing you say to him is going to change the end of that. However, what he says to you in your prayer time can help you master wherever you are in life. And so it's very, very important that you approach prayer from the viewpoint of, I'm going to talk with my daddy. Daddy, this is what's going on. Yeah. What you think about that? Yeah. And then we shut up. Yeah. And we listen. Yeah. And we get in that passion translation. <laughs> or the new living translation. Or the message. Whatever one works for you, yeah. he will begin to yeah. speak to you through his word. And give you answers and strategies yeah. and keys. And things that you need to be aware of. And if you don't get it from there, later in the day you'll have a conversation with someone. And that person will say something to you that sparks in your spirit. And you go, ooh, that was God, because I was praying about that this morning. Or something will happen in life that causes a detour. And you'll say, this must be God's direction, because I asked about this. So there's different ways that God communicates. But prayer is about your relationship with him. Okay? Forgiveness isn't even a temporal thing. That's about eternity. And that's why sometimes when we do things, the consequences remain, because that's just the natural outpouring of what you did. It doesn't mean God didn't forgive you, but you're stuck with the consequence, and that's why he doesn't want you to do that. So when you go in prayer and you ask for forgiveness, you are forgiven, but now you're probably going to need some answers on how to deal with the consequence. Yeah. You see? So it's very important to realign why we pray. It's not to push God around. He's not Santa Claus. He's not a slot machine. It is about your relationship. Yeah. Of That's where you get your identity piece yeah. from. Yeah. That's where you get your security and your affirmation and your validation from. When he tells you in the morning, I love you, daughter. Yeah. 
and you go, I love you too, Dad. Okay? Work on that intimacy. Beautiful. Love that. Amen. So we are running out of time. I just have one more question, um, and that is, what is the thinking behind being, a, being absolved of our sins through the death of Christ? How does Jesus dying on the cross free me of my sins? Why did he have to die? Okay, well, that's a whole theological thing. Okay. In the beginning, okay. Um, in the beginning, before Christ, and Christ was before time, you know that. That's why he was called the Lamb of God from the very beginning. God knew what was coming, and he had already made a provision, but he allowed the whole Old Testament to unfold so that man could see his need for a Savior. So sin happened and he made up this very difficult way of the sacrifice, finding the unblemished lamb, killing it, pouring out its blood. Um, then they had the scapegoat, which they would place sins on and set it out into the wilderness. They had all these natural ways of absolving uh, for forgiveness. OK, but we needed a more permanent measure because God knew of a time when we might get arrested for killing that lamb, and, you know, um, and so the Lamb of God came and he said, we're going to solve this once and for all. Okay. So he came and he died and he became the Lamb of God, God's perfect sacrifice for us because why? He loved us so much he couldn't bear the thought of being separated from us. And so he said, I am going to pay for their sin. God said, who will I send? And Jesus said, I will go. And remember how I talked about last night about him folding himself, folding himself and folding himself. And now he's in us and he's unfolding himself. So the lamb came, he died. And that was the payment. So Jesus, God said, if you'll just take the payment, I will cancel your debt. Because as long as we're in sin, we're indebted to God. Because he's given us life, he's given us breath, he's given us everything, and we're separated from him. So he becomes, you know, just like any bill collector, you know, the phone company doesn't care anything about you or your hardship when you can't pay your bill, right? But God wanted you to be able to pay your bill. So he gave you the money to pay your bill through the blood of Jesus Christ. So that redemption now makes us in right standing with God so that we can now come before him boldly yeah. and make our request. Remember when Jesus died and the veil was rent in the temple that separated the Holy of Holies from the outer, the inner court? Yeah. And so now we can go all the way from the outer court to the inner court yeah. to the Holy of Holies, bold access. We can walk in and say, Daddy, I have this need. And he goes, okay, baby, here you are. Yeah. Okay, so now that's forgiveness. Okay, and that has eternal ramifications. That means we will stand before him. Now the sin part of everyday life and working that out is based on escaping natural consequences here on earth. And so there's a big difference. He wants us to be with him and he wants us to come not bloodied and covered in scars from our bad mistakes and choices. And so he says, the more that you submit to my will, the more joy and peace you will have. Now, we're not promised a perfect life because we live in a life filled with sin. So sometimes the sins of others cause us to suffer. But God will always be there to surround us, to support us, and to get us through it. And even that mess becomes a ministry for someone. That test becomes a testimony. And so we learn to use all things, and that's why he says, all things work together for the good. Joseph, who was sold into slavery and lied on and gone to jail, in the end became the right-hand man of Pharaoh, and he named one of his children Ephraim, which meant God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. And that's what God is looking for in our lives, fruit that is squeezed from the afflictions that we face. Amen. Amen. That's juicy. Wow. That's juicy. As Nanda says, that's juicy. <laughs> 
And on that juicy note, we have come to the end of our question and answer panel. I wish we had another hour. An hour. It would be fun. Next year, two years, two hours. Two hours. We already went from <laughs> half an hour last year to an hour this I year. I know. It just keeps going <laughs> but on and on. Thank you for making us laugh as well as answering these very real, yeah. deep questions that our, uh, that our women have. So let's put our hands together for our guests. And um, 